Whichever doesn't matter. They're all thousand dollars. <laughs> <laughs> Upcoming events after that, um, Jagannath Snan Yatra, we're doing on Sunday, May 7th. We will be doing a Snan Yatra here. We'll also be having a special drama here, a Jagannath drama that day, hopefully. Yeah, Krishna willing, Jagannath willing. And a Snan Yatra in preparation for Rath Yatra coming the following week on Saturday, May 13th. Pasipani Rath Yatra, which will be ending at our new temple site. And we'll be having a festival in a uh, beautiful cultural program in the parking lot of our new temple on that day, on Saturday, May 13th, our first major event at our new temple location. So just progress is being made. The temple is manifesting before our very eyes. So um, I won't go through all of these. You can check our website on isconofnewjersey.org. We have a, a very nice events page in the interest of time. We won't skip, skip all of these events, but uh, they are there. We have picnics, we have uh, seminars, we have dramas, um, we have the disciples, so lots of things happening still. So, um, Pasipani Temple update, um, as I said, um, a lot of progress being made there. The asphalt is, uh, we're preparing and cleaning up for the asphalt to be laid and uh, clean up the whole area in preparation for Ratyatra. So, very quickly, let's recite our prayer and then we'll continue. Please uh, repeat after me. Our dear Lord Krishna. Our dear Lord Krishna. Kindly give us your causeless mercy. Kindly give us your causeless mercy. And allow us to become instruments. In the service of Srila Prabhupada. In the service of Srila Prabhupada. Let us follow in his footsteps. To grow the movement. And build this new temple. In your service. Srila Prabhupada. So <clears throat> our class speaker this week, of course, we have a very, very special speaker, His Grace Radhika Raman Prabhu. Um, if you haven't been attending the seminar, we have just concluded the seminar at 4 o'clock. Uh, Prabhu has been uh, giving us a beautiful understanding of forgiveness as a principle um, based on Srimad Bhagavatam. So um, if you weren't able to attend, you can catch it on uh, our YouTube recordings at some point. So certainly. So, um, for those of you who again don't know Radhika Raman Prabhu, he is um, a professor at uh, Utah State University. Um, he was one of the uh, youngest people ever to obtain a PhD from Oxford. I think at the age of 18 or something, uh, he had his PhD. Um, and uh, numerous awards, and he's very, very active. He's part of the uh, Shastric Advisory Council in Ishbon and very many other services he performs and uh, travels widely and preaches. We're very, very fortunate that uh, he's able to find a weekend to spend with us and uh, uh, just uh, give us his association. So we look forward to future events and things, but uh, very, very happy that he's here with us today. So let's welcome him with three loud Hari Bulls. Uh, thank you all for this opportunity to speak a little bit about Bhagavad Gita. It's uh, always such a pleasure to be here in New Jersey. This time it's been close to four years, maybe five. And um, and uh, so um, it's been a long time, but it's wonderful to see old friends here as well and to see the progress of the new temple. It was quite, when I visited um, yesterday, uh, quite amazed by the sheer scale and size. You can really feel it now when you walk through that property. So it's really a wonderful work that all of you are doing. I know it's a community project, and and it's um, you you have you have people around uh, this country, devotees around this country, uh, in awe at uh, what you're doing here. So it's an inspiration, not just uh, for us uh, here, but also. Um, around uh, the country and around the world, where devotees, I, places I go to and they talk about this project that's coming up and how wonderful it is. So thank you for doing this wonderful seva for Srila Prabhupada. And uh, welcome to the Sunday Feast. We'll begin with a short prayer, uh, Jai Radha Mata, uh, to Radha and Krishna. I would, I would, I would. Yeah. 
श्री गणिताय की श्री काराम लक्ष्मण हनुमान की श्रीनाथ की श्रीमद भगवद गीता की ओम नमो भगवते वासुदेवाय 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 so today I want to read three verses from Bhagavad Gita in quick succession. These are the last three verses of chapter 10. And in chapter 10, what Krishna does is he shows Arjuna how he can be seen in every aspect of this world. He's, he talks about how among each category of being, he can be seen, right? So he says, of rivers, I am the Ganga. And he says, of seasons, I am this season, spring. And he says, of bodies of water, I am the ocean, and among cheaters, I am gambling. And he talks about all kinds of things and uh, shows us how we can experience him in this world. And after going through all of those different um, descriptions, all the details about how Krishna is, can be found here and here and here, he finally stops that and says, actually, um, what's the point of all this detailed knowledge? And those are the verses that I want to read for you now, okay? So, um, we won't do this in repetition since uh, we don't all have copies of the book, uh, but please listen carefully. Uh, this is text 40. Nantosti mama devyanam Vibhuti nam parantapa, Vibhuti nam parantapa, Esha tu desha ta proto, Esha tu desha ta proto, Vibhute vistaro maya, Vibhute vistaro maya. Either there's a lot of people here who have memorized the Bhagavad Gita, <laughs> or you're very good listeners. <laughs> <laughs> that was impressive. So, uh, thank you. This is translation and purport by Srila Prabhupada. O mighty conqueror of enemies, there is no end to my divine manifestations. What, a, what I have spoken to you is but a mere indication of my infinite opulences. And Prabhupada's very short purport. As stated in the Vedic literature, although the opulences and energies of the Supreme are understood in various ways, there is no limit to such opulences. Therefore, not all the opulences and energies can be explained. Simply a few examples are being described to Arjun to pacify his inquisitiveness. Text 41. This is a famous one. Yad yad vibhuti mat sattvam Yad yad vibhuti mat sattvam Shrimad urjitam evava Shrimad urjitam evava Tat tat eva vagachatvam Tat tat eva vagachatvam Mama te jongsha sambhavam Mama te jongsha sambhavam Know that all opulent, beautiful and glorious creations spring from but a spark of my splendor. And another short purpose by Shri Prabhupada. Any glorious or beautiful existence should be understood to be but a fragmental manifestation of Krishna's opulence. Whether it be in the spiritual or material world, anything extraordinarily opulent should be considered to represent Krishna's opulence. And last verse. Athava bahunai tena Athava bahunai tena Kim gyate natavar juna Kim gyate natavar juna Vishtabhyaham idam kritsnam Vishtabhyaham idam kritsnam Ekang shena stito jagat Ekang shena stito jagat But what need is there, Arjun, for all this detailed knowledge? With a single fragment of myself, I pervade and support this entire universe. Please repeat. But what need is there? But what need is there? 
Arjun, Arjun, for all this detailed knowledge, for all this detailed knowledge, with a single fragment of myself, with a single fragment of myself, I pervade and support, I pervade and support this entire universe. This entire universe. So the question that I want to raise here is, or, um, or discuss, is Krishna's question, which is, what is the need for all this detailed knowledge? For those of us who have read Bhagavad Gita, and even more so if we've read Srimad Bhagavatam, or other such wonderful scriptures like Chaitanya Chaitanya we find that there is so much detailed knowledge that is given. Um, Krishna explains all the details of Sankhya philosophy, the different aspects of knowledge, and the different um, uh, 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 the difference between the, the soul and the body. When you get to Srimad Bhagavatam, you have uh, examples of hundreds of different uh, pastimes or leelas by Krishna, dozens of his different avatars. You have detailed descriptions of this cosmos and the different planetary systems, and step by step about how creation happens. You have details of different dynasties and how one person is born from another, from another, and from another, and in this way all these kings and queens are related. You have details about everything. There is so much material there. And Krishna here is asking, what need is there, Arjun, for this detailed knowledge? With just a single fragment of myself, I support and maintain this entire universe. So, indeed, what need is there? for detailed knowledge. On the one hand, the answer to Krishna's question is nothing. There's no need for all this detailed knowledge. One point that Krishna is making is that no matter if we pursue detailed knowledge with the goal to understand it all, we will fail. We will fail. The Upanishads describe the Supreme as he from whom all words turn away, he from whom all attempts at understanding and logic turn away, that person who is so great that we have no capacity to reach the limit of um, Krishna's dis, uh, 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 glories, his qualities. Uh, in fact, it's said in Chaitanya Chaitamrita that Anantashesh that thousand-headed hooded serpent upon whose uh, coils Lord Vishnu lies, he is continuously reciting the Lord's glories uh, with all his thousand mouths all the time, and yet he has not yet in all of eternity reached the end of the Lord's qualities. And philosophers have attempted to seek the limits and wrap their really intelligent minds around the absolute, around Krishna, around the divine, as uh, Bhagavatam describes near its end. Yam Brahma Varunendra Rudra Maruta Stunvanti Divyaistavai This is that person whom Brahma and Varuna and Rudra and the Maruts and all the Devas, Stunvanti, they're glorified. And even the Upanishads and the Vedas Samaga. They're all singing about the Lord's qualities. Yasyantam Navidu Sura Suragana Devaya Tasmainava. And yet they have not been able to find the end, reach the end. When Maharaj Yudhishthir in the Mahabharata, he's having this conversation with the Yaksha, who's asking him a lot of challenging questions before he will let them the Pandavas drink from his pond, uh, from his lake. Uh, at that, one of those questions that he asks them is where is dharma to be found? Where can we find the right path? And his answer is quite striking. He answers in ways similar to way, how Krishna answers here. He says, Tarko pratishtha shutayo vibhinna naiko rishiryasya matam pramanam Tarko pratishtha shrutayo vibhinna naiko rishiryasya matam pramanam dharmasya tattvam nehitam guhayam 
He says, actually, dharma is, is incredibly difficult to understand. Not the least because tarko pratishta, logic, is inconclusive in this matter. You can't quite establish what is the absolute truth just by using your logic, just by using your brain. And that makes sense, because if the absolute truth is greater than us, then if it were the case that we could wrap our minds around that absolute truth, then it would mean what? That our mind is superior to that absolute truth, which would mean what? That we are that absolute truth. And that is one thing I'm certain of, that I'm not, right? I'm not that divine being. So clearly, if something is greater than us, then our minds, just like our bodies, would be limited in trying to achieve it. Tarko pratishta, shutayo vibhinna. And the scriptures say many different things also. Naiko rishir matam pramanam. All the sages, all the philosophers throughout history have differed and made different arguments. One has argued against the other. Uh, one of the greatest philosophers in Greek philosophy was Plato. And his, uh, they say, in fact, that all philosophy after that are simply footnotes to Plato. He was that great. And yet his disciple Aristotle argued against everything he said and presented a whole different perspective. And this has been going on. If you study the history of philosophy in India or in the West, this is the story. Right? One great mind, and you read their works, and it's like, wow, they found the truth. This is, this is brilliant. It makes 100% sense. Until you read the next guy. And then you realize, well, uh, this, this first one had a lot of problems, but this one has the truth. It's clear. Right? It makes so much sense. Until you read the next one. And in this way, there's no foundation there. So on the one hand, the answer to Krishna's question is simply nothing. There's no use. There's no use for all this detailed knowledge. If we're approaching it from a purely intellectual perspective, uh, from an epistemological perspective, from the idea of I'm going to figure out how to wrap my head around it. Krishna is saying there's no use. But if we approach the same question, what is the use of all this detailed knowledge? <coughs> from an experiential perspective, from a perspective of practice, from how it can impact our lives, from the perspective of devotion, there's a lot of use for all this detailed knowledge. What is that use? Well, first of all, all this detailed knowledge gives us an inkling of just how, what it means when we say God is great, God is powerful. Prabhupada used to say, you say God is great, but do you know how great he is? Uh, here we are in Tawako, New Jersey. New Jersey is a fairly important part of the world, but it's a small part of the world. And it's situated in a much larger country, a vast country, and I come from the other side, from Utah. Very far away. Huge nation. Right? Lots of beautiful things to see and to experience, especially in Utah. Lots of nice national parks. And all around that, this nation of the United States, just one piece of such a huge world that we live in, with all its variety and all its diversity and all its land and all its water and all its air. And this world, a tiny little speck floating in this vast ocean of space where they say 99% of it or something is space, it's empty. Right? Little specks of islands floating. And yet that solar system is vast and one little piece of a huge galaxy that is one little piece of millions of stars and galaxies, and all of those galaxies, just one universe among millions of universes that are little like little mustard seeds floating in this huge cosmos. And all of those universes are just one breath of Lord Vishnu. He breathes in, and everything is gone. 
and he breathes out, and it's all come out again. So all that detailed knowledge, the step-by-step -step of how things are created, all points to this fact that Krishna is so great and so awe-inspiring. And that's valuable. Uh, if you study the science of flourishing, when do human beings flourish and be happy in this world? You will find that they flourish uh, when they have a sense of awe in their life. This is one key characteristic, especially awe connected to nature. Uh, this is a, a marker of people's happiness if they have some sense of awe for the natural world. Uh, it, it makes us happy. People's stress levels plummet when they're in situations where, oddly, they feel small compared to nature. Uh, when they go out and they're on top of a mountain peak and they feel tiny looking at the beautiful expanse there, they feel a sense of happiness and contentment. So recognition of God's greatness <coughs> is powerful as an experience. It's very valuable. All this detailed knowledge gives us that experience of God's greatness. But also, it does something else. Which is, not only does it set him apart and show how we are small in comparison, but it also shows how that great being is there in every aspect of creation. And that's the primary point of chapter 10. Right? That Krishna is there in every aspect of this creation. Whether it's the water, or it's the land, or it's the sky, or it's the sun, or the moon, Krishna is there. So not only is he out there, and not only are we small, and not only is he powerful, but he's also right here. He's in the air we breathe. He's in the water we drink. He's in the sun that we bask in. My favorite metaphor, analogy for this in Bhagavad Gita is when Krishna says in chapter 7, Matta parataram nanyat kinchidasti dhananjaya Mai sarvam idam prothan sute manigana Krishna says, everything rests upon me like pearls are strung on a thread. If you encounter a well-made necklace, a characteristic of that necklace is that you cannot see the thread. And so this world is as well. That Krishna is part of everything in this world, just like a thread. The thread goes through every pearl. We know that. Because otherwise the pearl wouldn't hold on to the necklace. Right? So Krishna's in everything. And yet he is so deeply in everything that we may not see him if we choose not to. He's there in all places and in all things. Now, there's a wonderful story of, uh, in Chaitanya Charitamrita. Uh, one time when Lord Brahma comes to visit uh, uh, Krishna in Dwarka. And when he arrives on the door, on the gateway of Dwarka, uh, the gatekeeper uh, asks him, um, who are you? Uh, who are you? He, why are you here? And he says, I am Brahma. I'm here to see Krishna. So the gatekeepers in Dwarka are used to getting big personalities there. They're the gatekeepers for Krishna. So without without much anxiety or worry, he says, okay, let me let him know. And he goes inside, and he tells Krishna, Brahma is here to see you. Now Krishna knows that Brahma is coming a little bit full of himself. He's a little, uh, you know, he understands. He's the soul, super soul in the heart. So he sends his guard back out, and he says, asks, he says, tell him, ask him, which Brahma has come? <laughs> and so he comes out, and he says, my Lord is asking which Brahma has come. And Brahma is rather taken aback and slightly insulted. And he says, what, what do you mean? It's the Brahma. Like, how many Brahmas are there? <laughs> and I'm the one, right? Like, it's, I'm, I, I run this universe. And the creator. 
school, so Krishna calls him in. And there, when he calls him in, Brahma shows up, and um, he sees arriving, along with him, all the different Brahmas from all these different universes, uh, with beautiful forms and hundreds of heads. Our Brahma has four. These other universes have six, or eight, or ten, or a hundred, or a thousand. And it says that all of them come and they bow before Krishna. And the, the crowns on their heads make a large crashing sound as they do that. And our Brahma feels like a little fly in the wall. He, 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 he experiences that sense of being on the mountaintop and looking out at the range and going, wow. This is amazing. He experiences that sense of awe that makes all of us so happy. So that's one reason. Right? To recognize how great Krishna is and yet how he is present in everything, in all beings and in all things. What is the result of that recognition? For a devotee, that recognition naturally leads to a personal and emotional response of devotion. The result of knowledge should be a change of heart. That's what knowledge is made for. Uh, Krishna says this earlier in the 10th ch chapter. He says, Aham sarvasya prabhavo matta sarvam tarartate. Iti matva bhajante ma bodha bhava samandita. I am the source of all the creation, the spiritual and the material. Everything comes from me. One who knows this, one who knows this, worships me bhava samandita with their full heart, with their full emotion. They love me. One who knows this worships me with their heart. In other words, the result of knowledge is it should be a change of heart, a transformation of our... Um, there should be an emotional response to knowledge. This is important, it's significant, because we think of knowledge as a purely intellectual exercise. But what is the use of knowledge if it remains merely intellectual? Srimad Bhagavatam begins by saying, Vedyam vastava matra vastu shivadam muranam. That knowledge is reality distinguished from illusion for the welfare of all. Which means that you, reality distinguished from illusion, that's the intellectual side. But that's not where knowledge ends. It's reality distinguished from illusion for the welfare of all. And welfare is not an intellectual concept. Mm. Welfare is a relational concept. When you care about someone, when you look after someone's welfare, that means that there's a relationship, that there's care, that there's love, there's affection. Otherwise, there's no welfare. Right? Just like things don't care for anyone. Robots don't care for anyone. Computers don't care for anyone. It's, it's, there's no relationship there. But when there's a relationship, there's care. So knowledge dis is reality distinguished from illusion for the welfare of all. That emotional response is the very point of knowledge. Prabhupada used to sign all his letters. How? Your yeah, right, ever knowledge. Right, right. He would give knowledge. He would give guidance. But then he would explain why he was doing it. He would put it in context. Why am I writing this to you? Sometimes his letters were strong and difficult. Sometimes they were very sweet and easy. But always, you're ever well wishing. This is why I'm writing to you. Because I wish you well. Knowledge is reality distinguished from illusion for the welfare of all. And so, what's the use of all this detailed knowledge? Because when a devotee encounters Krishna's greatness and his presence in our life, the natural response of the devotee is to love Krishna. 
to experience a sense of amazement. Amazement that leads to affection, that leads to love. Where a devotee says, how wonderful is my Lord. That he can create a world, that he can produce a world with so much variety. So many wonderful rivers like the Ganga, with luminaries in the sky like the sun and the moon. How wonderful he is that he can produce trees and seasons like spring. That is the devotee's response. And that is indeed Arjun's response. When he, Krishna gives him this knowledge that he's the source of all creation, Arjun's response is not merely an intellectual one. He's not merely saying, oh yeah, that's, it. that's interesting. <laughs> okay, you're the source, huh? <laughs> it, it's, that's not his response. His response is, Param Brahma, Param Dhamma, Pavitram, Paramam Bhavan, Purusham, Shashatam, Divyam, Adi Devam, Majam, Vibhum. He's, he's, this verse, Param Brahma, Param Dhamma, Pavitram, Paramam Bhavan. He's repeating himself over and over again. This is, an, this is a, this is a uh, heartfelt, it's an ecstatic response from Arjun, the way he's speaking. Everyone has said this. All the rishis and everyone has told. And now, Swayam Jayava Prabhishima. I'm so lucky you're showing me yourself. You're telling me yourself. That's his response. So, for a devotee, this is how actually the word achintya or inconceivable is used again and again in our scriptures. Not merely as an intellectual concept. But in Chaitanya Charitamrita, if you read, whenever devotees read this, use this word achintya, inconceivable, they're not so in, saying, oh, it's so difficult to understand, my head hurts. It's inconceivable. They use that word to describe their sense of excitement and awe and love for Krishna, how wonderful he is. A, a great example of this is when after Krishna lifted Govardhan Hill, in Krishna book, Srimad Bhagavatam 10th Canto describes, Krishna lifted Govardhan Hill for seven days, seven nights. What an amazing feat. Right after that, after Krishna puts down the mountain and uh, Indra asks for forgiveness and all of that, right after that, there's a chapter called Wonderful Krishna, which is simply a conversation between the people of Vrindavan who sit together and go, how amazing is Krishna? Did you see that? Seven days and seven nights? He lifted a mountain for our protection. How wonderful he is. And do you remember the time that he killed Putana when he was just a baby? His behavior has been unusual right from the start, hasn't it? And could it be that he is some unusual person? Maybe he's even the supreme personality of God. Maybe. And in this way, their love for Krishna, their amazement at it, their, their devotion is growing and growing as a result of that experience of inconceivability, of an experience of that knowledge of Krishna's greatness. Mother Yashoda has a similar experience. As she looks in Krishna's mouth, sees all the universes there, and faints. And when she comes back, she loves Krishna even more, her wonderful child. Markandeya Rishi has a similar experience. He wants to see Krishna's inconceivable powers, his achintya shakti, his maya. And so he has Krishna breathes in and swallows him into his body, just like he does the universes. And there inside, he finds a huge ocean. And he's tumbling in that ocean. And as he's swimming and swimming and swimming, and he doesn't know when it's going to end, and if there's any shore, and he's struggling for his life, overwhelmed, being thrown about by the waves, in all of that chaos, he sees what? Baby Krishna. He sees Krishna on a leaf, floating. Sucking on his toe. Sucking on his toe. And this is Krishna's form of Vatapatra Shai, Krishna who li lies upon a banyan leaf, and he's sucking his toe. Imagine that incongruity. <laughs> he goes into the mouth of God, ends up in an ocean where he's being thrown about, seeing the immensity and power of God's creation. There's no end. Right? It's frightening. And in the middle of that all, 
is a baby sucking his toe. That's where the devotees are ends up, is there is there once again love relationship. The result of his knowledge is an encounter with Krishna as a child whom he can love. Um, there's a beautiful uh, song called uh, uh, that begins Vrindavana Ramyasthana. Perhaps you've heard this song before. Mm -hmm. It's a description of the ultimate vision of utopia for followers of Sri Chaitanya. That there is this place called Vrindavan. And in that place, beautiful place, Ramyasthan, there is a wonderful river, Galindi, the river Yamuna. And in there, there is a beautiful lotus with many petals. And on each petal is one of these gopis who are serving Krishna. And within the middle of that is a golden throne. And on that golden throne are the divine couple, Radha and Krishna. And the song ends by saying, and what is that ultimate, supreme, divine couple doing? They're joking with each other. They're laughing. That's it. You go all the way up to heaven, all through those universes, that grand scale that I was talking about, all that power and majesty, and where do you end up? Two people laughing. Because where else would you want to be? Right? Where else would you want to be except in a place where people can laugh? with each other, where they can joke. The result of all that immensity, why, what's the reason for all that detailed knowledge? Krishna is asking here. Just so we can get to know that person who is behind all of that, and within all of that, and greater than all of that. Just so we can have an opportunity to love him. We can have an emotional reaction. And by emotional, I mean something much deeper than surface emotion. From the deepest core of our hearts, we can have a relationship with him. Just so we can come to a place where we can laugh. That's what that detailed knowledge does. And the last thing it does, the last thing I want to mention, is... When we come to recognize, we see all that, all these things Krishna is describing, all these aspects of creation, and we come to recognize that every one of them is an aspect of Krishna. Yad yad vibhuti matsatvam. Whatever there is in this world that is beautiful, that is glorious, that's powerful, that's wonderful, that's awe-inspiring, whatever there is, is Krishna. Once a devotee recognizes this, we develop the capacity then to respect those good qualities everywhere we find them. A devotee's vision, as a result of this detailed knowledge, becomes such, as Prabhupada said in the purport that we read, that a devotee understands that wherever he or she sees something good, that that is Krishna. Whether we see that good in our country or in a foreign country, in our culture or in a different culture, in our religion or in a different religion, whether we see that here or outside, wherever we see it, yato, yato, yami, tato, nursing, wherever we go, if we see something good, a devotee immediately thinks, this is my Lord. Showing his face in another way, in a different way. That is wonderful, that is special, and that allows me to love him even more. And we see this especially in the qualities of Prahlad Maharaj, that despite the fact that he thoroughly disagrees with his father, yet he is able to respect him. Why? 
Not agree with him, not help him, but respect him. Why? Because he says that the power you have comes from the same source as the power I have. He sees that power present in a, some form, and he thinks this comes from Krishna. This is Krishna. Even though he totally doesn't disagree with his, uh, agree with his father, even though he is um, suffering at his hands, and yet he finds some space, some place, where he can see Krishna in that situation. He can see Krishna's qualities. He can see his presence. And this makes the devotee fearless. Because if everywhere you go, and everywhere you see power, opulence, wealth, beauty, good qualities, you think, this is Krishna. Then everywhere you see a friend. In all things, in all places, in all people. We see a friend, we see good qualities, we see an opportunity to learn, to grow. And this is the vision of the devotee. The devotee who is just starting on the spiritual path, thinks Krishna is very narrow. He's just mine and no one else. And everyone else is going to help. But a devotee who is more advanced sees Krishna in places, everywhere, and recognizes that he's showing his form in wonderful ways. Even as I am attached to Krishna, as that beautiful boy who sucks on his toe on a leaf, that's the form that I worship. And yet... When I see him in other forms, in other places, I can respect and I can honor. And I can grow in my own bhakti, seeing how Krishna shows up in other forms and other places. That's the benefit of all this detailed knowledge. When we go to the bank of a river, when we go into a forest, when we go anywhere we go, this is Krishna. So, what is the use of all this detailed knowledge? Krishna asks. On the one hand, there's no use. Purely intellectually, we'll never get to the end of it. But practically, experientially, devotionally, that detailed knowledge is powerful. It has amazing applications in our life. And this is why it's worth the time, the energy, to study Srimad Bhagavatam to study Bhagavad Gita, to study Chaitanya Charitamrita, to study all these scriptures, because they provide us all these points of connection with the person we want to love. In every aspect, in every way, we see how we connect with Krishna. Many of you attended the seminar that I gave in the last couple of days, where I was talking about forgiveness and describing the process to how to forgive and how to be forgiven. Each one of us is unique, and we're different, and our situations are different. And for some, the process I outlined may work, and for others, it may not work. That's actually not even the main point. If there's anything I hope that you will take from this weekend, it's that Srimad Bhagavatam, that our scriptures are practical, real accounts that can provide us guidance and application in our daily lives. Each one of these stories of Krishna and Sringi and Indra and Daksha, these are not merely stories of people way up there, so advanced and so amazing that we cannot even dream of being like them. They are stories of real people. The Shastas, we often say, are not fairy tales. And we usually say that in a historical sense. They're history. Yes. But here's another reason they're not fairy tales. Because fairy tales are never about the real world. Right? This is why we grow out of fairy tales. We don't keep telling those fairy tales to ourselves after a certain age. Because they're too black and white. They're too simplistic. Srimad Bhagavatam, Bhagavad Gita, these scriptures are about the real world. 
every psychological situation, physical situation, any situation we might encounter ourselves in, there's guidance there. We just have to find it. We have to learn how to read it in such a way that we can extract from it what we need. It may turn out that what we need in this situation, what you need in this situation, is nothing of what I said. It may not be there in the seminar this weekend, but it will be there in Srimad Bhagavatam. Mm. You will find a story, a katha, that speaks to you. Every real life circumstance in this world, from the terrible things to the most wonderful things, it's all there. From Hiranyakashipu and Uttanabad to the gopis of Vrindavan. Everyone is there. We just have to find it. We just have to find an application. When we call Srimad Bhagavatam or these scriptures moral stories or value stories, we're doing actually a great disservice to the scriptures. They're not merely moral stories with a moral at the end. No. They have all the complexity and all the richness and all the messiness of our real lives in this world. And this is why they're useful. <coughs> when Dhruva Maharaj leaves home, and he's so conflicted in his relationship with his father, that's a real world story. That's as messy as this world actually gets. And therefore, we can learn from it. Therefore, we can gain something from it. So this is the use of all this detailed knowledge. Why, Krishna is asking, do we want all this detailed knowledge? Because in all that detail, we will find our story. We will find something that speaks to us in this moment, at this time. And 10 years from now, when we're in a different time, in a different place, we will go back to the same book and we will find our story there again. We'll find something that speaks to us yet again. Another story, another Lila, another history that and guide us in that moment, in that place. That is the use of all this detailed knowledge. Thank you very much. So I have a flight to catch um, this evening <laughs> from Newark, so I'm going to have to run pretty quickly, otherwise we'd be happy to take questions, but I don't think uh, we have much time left. So I apologize for that, and um, thank you again for your hospitality this weekend. So, been another wonderful class by uh, so let's thank him again. Three loud Ali balls. Ali so one announcement I did miss, that um, there is also going to be a parenting workshop here on uh, April 23rd, what time? Uh.